On matters of vaccination, Kenya has accelerated the move and over time built its capacity to vaccinate 10 million people by December 2021 and 26 million by the end of 2022. As of now, over 4 million people have been vaccinated with only over 990,000 receiving the second dose. On this week's episode of Frontline, we get to track the vaccination exercise, the challenges, the milestones as we demystify some of the myths and misconceptions surrounding the vaccines. Ask your friend, where we change? The surest way to build that confidence is by making vaccines available. 98% of the people who are currently hospitalized ni watu ambao hawajachanjwa. My name is Lincoln Nombogo and this is Frontline. Now joining us in studio to discuss on the status of vaccinations in the country is Dr. Willis Akwale, the chairperson of the COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. Thank you so much for creating time, Dr. Willis. We've come a long way from testing and sampling in South Africa and now we have the capacity to do that ourselves. Remember, when we were doing that, we, had, we were testing about 8,000 a day, mm -hmm. sampling about 8,000 a day. Now the average is about 5,000, close to half mm -hmm. of what we were doing before. Mm -hmm. Why is this the case? Dr. Willis. No, uh, thank you first. Thank you for inviting me to the front line and uh, thank you for uh, starting with that question. That's an important question, the issue of testing. Testing is very key because it's, it's what informs uh, measures that are to be taken because it gives you an idea of the spread of the disease. So I know testing and uh, when this pandemic came and it, it affected a huge populations, um, the guidance was to do a certain number of tests so that you get a representative sample. And in Kenya, anything close to 10,000 being done daily would give you a very good representative sample. And yes, there were challenges because of uh, availability of the uh, testing kits. Remember, many of them are uh, not produced locally, so they, have, they had to be imported. At, th at that time, every country wanted them. But their availability and diversity has increased. And indeed, Kenya now is able to test uh, even 8,000 in a day. You can see now consistently about 5,000 uh, tests being done in a day. Yes. Dr. Willis, we have about five different types of doses in the country. Um, all of them, are all of them being distributed at the same time? And what criteria are you using to know who is supposed to get what, when? Yeah, so we, we have five vaccines. If you remember, we started with AstraZeneca. Uh, and AstraZeneca is stored at between 2 to 8 degrees um, centigrade, so just cooling, not refrigerated. We then got Moderna. Moderna is what you call messenger RNA and it has to be refrigerated at minus 20 degrees. And once it, uh, then we have Pfizer, which we started uh, vaccinating this week. It is stored at minus 70 and minus 80. Moderna and Pfizer have one thing in common that once they are removed from where they are stored at minus 20 or minus 70, they cannot be refrozen again. So they must be used within 30 days. So you need to take them to a place where there is a high population density. We, we have given guidance that you must be able to vaccinate 500 people per day. Secondly, they must not be transported for more than seven hours from where they have been stored because you also we don't want them to go below any temperature. They are very viable. Uh, so from the regional stores, so you, if you are picking from Eldoret and to a facility, it should not be more than seven hours. And then where you are going to use them, there must be a high population density. Yes. Then we have um, the other vaccine is Johnson & Johnson, which is a single shot. This one is easy to store and you can refrigerate it. And once you refrigerate it, you can easy, use it for even up to two years. And that is why we've recommended it to be used in, uh, in uh, areas where you have mobile populations, um, nomadic populations as, uh, uh, as such. And then we have the Chinese Sinopharm. Uh, it is also stored two to eight. The only thing it is not registered to be used in persons above 60 years of age because there's no data to show its safety there. Um, Dr. Willis, with the storage and the transportation of these vaccines, maybe the transportation might be done by the national government, mm -hmm. but uh, the storage and um, the distribution, mm -hmm. are the county governments capable of this? I had uh, the other day um, uh, Health CS Mujahi Kagwe say that some governors are not giving it 100%. 
-hmm. And that's why some counties are really lagging behind on the vaccination rate. Okay. So there are two important pieces to this question, I, uh, storage and, uh, and transportation. And then what you are really saying is the community mobilization, mm -hmm. people to come up and take the vaccines. Yes. Now, let me start by saying that the actual storage and distribution is, is co-shared between the national and county government. Now, from the airport, we take them to central vaccine store. That is national government. Then from the central vaccine store, we have nine regional stores in most of the former provincial hospitals. Each of them, there is a regional store. Again, the national government does the transportation until there. Now, it is from the regional stores that the counties then go to pick the vaccines. And they pick them directly to the facility. There are, very, there are only three counties that really have uh, county stores. So you have to take direct to a facility using your cooler boxes. Now, that is where then the counties have to put resources to go and pick the vaccines and take them to the facilities. Uh, up to now, it has been good, but we realize we are also doing childhood immunization. So there are vaccines to be collected for children, then this vaccine for COVID. COVID need not replace every vaccination. We, we, the prioritization of children is also very, very important. So what then um, uh, happens is that now you need more resources to ensure that turnaround time. And this is something that the government is looking at to see how they support the counties to do that. Now, but let me come to uptake. Like, and, and for us, how we measure the uptake is that you have a target population per county. Persons who are 18 years and, and above are eligible. And we track this on a daily basis, how many have been vaccinated. Our focus now is full vaccination. You have received two doses for vaccines that require two doses or Johnson & Johnson one dose. Now, when you start looking at it, you start seeing some counties are doing well. Nairobi in particular, followed by Kiambu. Uh, the, this is followed by Nakuru, uh, then Wasengishu and Nyeri. These are counties where the uptake is very good. And then we have the counties in the semi-arid areas. Lamu, Tana River, Marsabit, uh, Mandera, those, the uptake is very low. But this week, we brought to the attention of Kenyans, we have counties in Western and Nyanza who have a high population, uh, but the uptake is low. A, a, a county like Kakamega has 1 million eligible people to be vaccinated, but by, I think, Wednesday, slightly over 21,000. Uh, had been vaccinated. Dr. Kuala, talking of uh, the five um, vaccines that are in the country, Moderna is one of them. Countries like Finland have limited the uptake of uh, Moderna amongst younger men, citing some rare uh, cardio cardiovascular um, side effects. What's mm -hmm. your take on this? Yeah, uh, let me say that um, just like even in the beginning of uh, this vaccination, we used to hear of clots with AstraZeneca, you heard of clots with um, uh, Johnson & Johnson, and by the way, clots even with Pfizer. Uh, so when vaccines are under what you call emergency use, there are certain rare conditions that you, are, you monitor. And if you identify that they are happening, uh, you, 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 there are two things you can do. You can do a very close monitoring of the same. You could stop the use and inform the regulator. Now, what has been found with the Moderna is that Yes, there are rare cases of what you call myocarditis, which basically means an inflammation of the heart. Uh, it, it causes that, but again, this is uh, mild and is self-limiting. Uh, so, uh, so in other countries, remember then, they have choices of very many other vaccines that are available to them. But the World Health Organization position on uh, myocarditis and Moderna is that the benefits of the vaccination still far outweigh the risks of not getting vaccinated. Let me take you back, uh, Dr. Willis. You spoke of uh, um, low vaccination uptake among us, especially ASAL communities, mm -hmm. ASAL counties. Uh, what could you attribute to this? Yeah, I think it's a matter of uh, various factors. Number one, uh, when you look at the whole uh, aspect of um, uh, hesitancy, you start by confidence in the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And confidence comes from information and knowledge, your understanding. 
and therefore that calls for also literacy level because for people to understand how the vaccines are working they need to have a higher literacy level remember a lot of messages are in english they're in radio they're what so a uh, part of maybe low literacy level is a factor the other one is the geographic access uh, you may want to be vaccinated but the vaccination post is very far in this country during the very first um, um, rollout we didn't have adequate vaccines because of global shortage so in very many counties including the ones in asal you could get two facilities vaccinating so consider a whole um, county like Marsabit with maybe two or three vaccination posts. That is massive. So that decreases access. Now, so then the question is, what are we doing? One of the things we've done in the past three or four weeks is that we are increasing the vaccination posts. We've worked with counties. We used to have about 800 vaccination posts across the country. We are increasing this to 3,000 and hopefully 4,000 before the end of the year. And with that increase, we have asked the counties to be the ones to identify through a process we call micro planning, identify where there are many people living, put posts closer to the people. So that is one. The other one is outreaches. And I must uh, here really say we are partnering with uh, partners in the health sector. The Kenya Red Cross in particular has come forward and is supporting seven of the counties in the Asal region. They are supporting outreaches, they are supporting sensitization meetings, uh, and, and uh, they, they, are, they are supporting other uh, activities that will ensure that the people that are targeted for vaccinations are reached. Um, Dr. Willis, can you please paint for us a brief picture of the COVID-19 situation in terms of um, the, the, the rates and the vaccination in the country so far? For me, I would say this is a very strange disease. It defies a lot of the principles we understand of highly infectious disease. You look at the, the graphs, the, we call them ep epidemiological graphs or epigraphs, and when you think it has reached the peak and it should start flattening because we are putting all the intervention, you see it coming down and it goes up. The other thing, if you really look at our waves, there was the first wave. Yes. The second wave went higher. The third wave went higher. We are now coming through the fourth wave. We are just started coming down it. But you can see it was also pushed. So it seems every wave is pushing the other wave higher. So we, we need to be aware that the fifth wave may be higher than the fourth wave. And that's why it worries me that if we are not fully vaccinated, then we have a challenge. You know, vaccination, the aim of vaccination is protection. It's not that you go for a vaccination when now you're feeling sick. Now that the rates are, have come down, people should not lose their guard and say, ah, this is you going to Emesha, Aijaisha. Now is the time we should get so many people vaccinated so that the fifth wave, the, the impact is mitigated, is reduced. It is not as high. It should get lower. That is when we will see the benefits of vaccination. This is really the time to get vaccinated. Talking about the fifth wave, is there a possibility of having another variant? Yes. If you really look at um, coronaviruses, and uh, first, even the virus itself, we had the SARS in early two, 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 two or three, then we got the what we call mi Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and then we now got the SARS-CoV-2, which initially is very close to the SARS. Now, within 20 years, we have three coronaviruses. And among these viruses, they can quickly change. There, there's gene mutation. Some of the changes are mild. Others start becoming severe. It is, it is uh, what you call evolution and survival tactics. The genes may change in such a way that it maybe evades the vaccine, it evades your natural immunity, or it even starts affecting other organs of the body, and that starts becoming severe. So, and every time the scientists are monitoring this, I know now we've been talking of the Delta, but there's a very variant coming in South America I think they're either calling it gamma or they may have given it another name. And it is 
going they are saying it it, it it may also be severe than delta and we could get variants anywhere kenyans should not think that uh, kenya is not a, a, a kitchen for variants we could easily start getting our own variant it could be mild it could be severe we now take a short commercial break, but we'll be right back with Dr. Willie Sakwala, the chairperson of the COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. But before that, many have been asking, how long should a person who has contracted COVID-19 wait to get vaccinated? To answer this question, he's the World Health Organization Chief Scientist, Dr. Sumir Somi Nathan, addressing just that. You can take the vaccine actually once you've recovered from COVID. So waiting for a few weeks, is recommended. You should have no symptoms at all and you should feel perfectly well when you take your vaccination. However, there are differences between countries. Some countries recommend that people wait for three months or six months till uh, after the infection. And this is because you have natural antibodies, which will keep you protected for at least that long. And because there are shortages of vaccine supplies in many countries they are requesting people who've had the infection to wait wale ambao hawajakuwa vaccinated wajitahidi wapate chanjo na wale ambao wamepata chanjo ya kwanza na hawajamaliza chanjo ya pili wafanye bidii pia wapate ile chanjo ya pili prevention is better than cure kama gavana anapewa hii vaccine na iko na hizo vitu ndani wanajua contents hivyo so lazima wako na scientists wanajua contents za vaccine na nini na tuko na parasitizers kubwa kama chemry hizo za research bora tuwezi jiundia vaccine yetu other people work till late hours so if they could make it a must thing they go to where people work there are job places uh, it would be a good thing naomba tu serikali ifanye bidii kutoa majibu ya wale ambao wamekuwa wamechanjwa Thank you for keeping it sweet. We continue this discussion on the status of vaccination in the country with Dr. Willis Akwale, who is a chairperson of the COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. Dr. Willis, how many vaccine defaulters do we have as of now? Uh, we we've been having we, we by the beginning of september let me start there uh, we had expected uh, to have vaccinated 900,000, but we had two doses we were at 800 so we were at about uh, 100,000 defaulters now this has slightly reduced and we estimate anything like 70,000 as defaulters okay. now uh, let me say what drove the default a lot of people who had received the first dose of AstraZeneca, which was the vaccine we had until beginning of August, were looking forward for other different vaccines. So when they had Moderna has come, they had Pfizer is coming, they had Johnson is coming, many of them were now saying, let me get a different one. And that was a major contributor to, the, uh, to that. I think we've done our part and really educated that no vaccine is better than the other one. We've consistently passed this message and I think people have started realizing uh, that. And in fact, what is also interesting, and I have reports, for example, somebody was saying, let me wait for Moderna. And because Moderna tends to give you a fever and makes you a bit sick, then others were saying, nilitaka yo lakini ahere ni rudi AstraZeneca. So, uh, we are getting but however let me say the challenge of defaulters will be here with us what are we going to do we plan to use community health workers to try and track defaulters we want to start using technology to identify where there could be and try to reach them in time so that they can they get their second doses uh, dr release what is the risk of staying too long overdue without getting the second jab the risk is that the initial antibodies that primed your body may completely wear off. So when you get a second dose, remember the second dose comes to challenge your body. It's telling your body, somebody visited you, I've come back. And then your body fights. So it should identify the antibodies. So your antibodies then are, your body immune system throws a lot more antibodies. And that's why after the second dose, you are protected much longer. So if you stay for too long, then the antibodies will win to a point that 
you should be considered like you have to restart your vaccination. Dr. Willis, there are some Kenyans who have gotten the first dose and they got um, a, a message from the Ministry of Health telling them when to expect the second dose, but they did not get that notification. When should they expect to go back? The issue of the reminder, uh, I know there were there are two reasons we've had a challenge. There's a time we had to shift the second dose of AstraZeneca to 12 weeks, which was within WHO recommendation. Uh, but, you, you know, within the change of system, occasionally, when you do manual entry of data, you somebody came, there were a mobile number, the clerk enters the wrong number, you could get a message going to the wrong number. So you don't get... That's why we are encouraging people to do self-registration. So you are the one putting all your details in it. That will improve the reminder, issues to do with reminders. Uh, so, but as a guide, a guide, AstraZeneca, second dose, eight weeks. Moderna, 30 days. Moderna, 28 days, sorry. Pfizer, 28 days. Sinopharm, 28 days. Johnson, there's no second dose. Um, manufacturing vaccines ourselves, when, sh when should we expect the country to start manufacturing vaccines and do we have that capacity? The government has just formed a, a company that is being called Kenya Biovax Limited, uh, which is going to negotiate and enter into arrangements with the uh, people already in the manufacturing industry. And at the point where we are discussing uh, there are what we call non-disclosure agreements that I can't go into that but the discussions are there uh, if that is finalized we project and we go into partnership we want to start with what we call fill and finish which basically means that we get the ingredient the vaccine already uh, done in bulk in huge tanks and we do the filing and finishing here for now consumption and our target is already those vaccines that are already approved by WHO. So according to that plan, we, we are, we, we, we are uh, giving ourselves until end of March to be the time, March next year, to be the time that we are able to produce a vaccine. Dr. Kuala, no many Kenyans are asking, do you foresee reopening the economy by the end of the year? As long as they get vaccinated. And some have already gotten the, the second dose and they're wondering, when are we going to reopen the country? They should look for their neighbors, their friends, their relatives. Let them make sure their parents are vaccinated. Let them, every time you meet somebody, ask them, if you're not vaccinated, you're the one closing the country. Currently, we have this campaign. We are looking for 5.8 million warriors, heroes. Those will be vaccinated to help us open this economy. Is there anything we could do better as a country? For me as a country, is uh, what I would really say is that uh, Kenyans tend to ask what is the government doing? Mm -hmm. The government can do A, B, C, D up to Z and in, in this issue of vaccine, it is doing everything. It has brought the vaccines, it has distributed them, it is educating people, it is, it is even uh, doing outreaches. But now, you the individual, you know health really starts with you, it cannot start with anybody. You must take charge of your health yourself. You make that decision to get vaccinated. And the other thing, to practice the public health measures. I think as a country, even as we fight COVID, the lesson we should know, bad, poor sanitation, bad hygiene is a major cause for so many other diseases. We are, we, last year, we started realizing diarrhea diseases were going down as we improved our hygiene. So for me, I think hygiene, self-discipline, and compliance to public health measures, we need to do that better. Wow. Thank you so much for the insights. And for you, for you, for our viewers, if you haven't received the jab, you're being asked to receive that jab today. Our guest has been Dr. Willy Sokwale, who is a chairperson of the COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. Thank you again for joining us. Till next week, same time, stay safe. My name is Lincoln Obogo, and my producer has been Harold Chimere. Good evening.